what I propose to do is spend about 45 minutes, maybe 40, maybe 37, I don't know, but maximum 45 minutes, on a few reflections about what experiences, adventures, and encounters shaped uh, or misshaped me for the last nine decades. Uh, I would like to bookend this presentation with two points. One by W.B. Yeats, an Irishman, and one by uh, Eunice de Souza, an Indian. Now, first of all, I would like you all to close your eyes and keep them closed until I finish. I went out to the Hazelwood because a fire was in my head. I cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. When I had laid it on the floor and gone to blow the fire aflame, something rustled by my side and something called me by my name. It had become a glimmering girl with apple blossoms in her hair who called me by my name and ran and faded on the brightening air. Though I am old with wandering through hollow lands and hilly, hilly lands, I will find out where she has gone and kiss her lips and take her hand and pluck till time and times are done the silver apples of the moon, the golden apples of the sun. So now you may open your eyes. I call this talk the kingfisher and the kite, chasing the immeasurable. And another subtitle, we draw in order to see. So please open your eyes. Architecture is, at its finest, a spiritual art. But its realization <coughs> is a balancing act between the spiritual and the pragmatic. I was fortunate to have had good physical balance, even today, despite the fact that I was injured last week. As a teenager, I could always climb tall trees and walk on high ledges or parapets. I enjoyed underwater swimming and diving for bridges and walls and trees. This was much very useful later in architecture. Thus, I had no fear of exploring a secret narrow passage hidden in the thick wall that we uncovered during modeling or remodeling of the 17th century gate theater in Dublin. I could also walk up to the rim of the Pantheon's oculus, although I had to lie down to peer over the knife-edged rim. I could take my students into the tight roof spaces of the Gesù in Rome or the Duomo in Firenze. I could examine the underwater structure of a Mexican swimming pool. I find myself, therefore, part kingfisher and part kite. The two birds, one tiny, one large, seek security and solitude. The kingfisher nests in a river bank, whereas the kite, like the stork, the heron, or the eagle, nests in a high place like a treetop or a remote open space. The kingfisher makes a two-foot deep tunnel well above the water in the riverbank and opens a chamber. Oh, do we have a pointer here? Oh, I guess we do, somewhere. Oh, it doesn't matter, you can see. He opens a chamber where he makes a nest of feathers and fish bones. A 10th century monastic community, 
use a cliff face in similar fashion at Castel Sant'Elia in north of Rome in Italy. The kite, equally uh, uh, inventive, looks for their strong sticks for its nest, but in their absence will steal construction tie wires and make the nest out of those. Steel wires. Thank you. The black button in the front. No, point it the other way. That black button right there. Ah, great. Steel wires nest. Humans seeking the life of the spirit sometimes create parallels with both the kite and the kingfisher. My fascination with kite-like adaptability was furthered by Rainer Sen's chapel for the Abbey Pierre's community of rag pickers on a dump near Nice. With his brother, he built the structure for less than $100. For scaffolding, he used bed frames from the city dump, and all the other materials were similarly scavenged. The wood, the gravel for the floor, the roofing. A beautiful, simple little chapel. Fourth century monks sought refuge sometimes in the desert as a way to foster the spiritual over the material. They were thus antithetical to the Cyrenaics, who believed that pleasure in material delights was the, ult the ultimate goal in life. Some gathered in Cenobitic groups like those organized by Pacomus, Pacomius, sorry, father of Western monasticism in the Egyptian desert. Some sought solitude in caves or in openings in the soft tufa of Cappadocia. When the desert became crowded, some fled to remote mountain peaks or pinnacles, as in Meteora or Mount Athos in Greece. A few really determined Copts sailed out of the Mediterranean into the Atlantic to find the most remote peak of all, the 600-foot rock of Ireland, Skellig Michael. You cannot see their settlement, but it's up there. Even in the 1950s, two Benedictine monks from New York went far out into the desert of New Mexico where eventually George Nakashima, wonderful architect, who had worked in India, by the way, and in Japan, designed for them a chapel with cave-like... Oops, sorry. <laughs> These are the, the settlements, the monastic settlements, 6th century on Skelligvihl by the Coptic monks. They are still there today. You can visit them. But George Nakashima designed this wonderful adobe chapel in the desert, 13 miles up a lonesome trail, a dangerous trail, opposite uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's place. The cave-like apses on three sides of this altar and the view of the high cliffs and the tiny trees, which are about 50 feet high on top, intrigued me the first time I went there. Thomas Merton called this the most beautiful monastic chapel in America. So we go back a bit. This drawing <coughs> of my father, by my father was made <coughs> on the day I took my first steps as a baby. I walked my first few steps into my father's patch of Brussels sprouts where I thrilled to the uncannily beautiful green light filtered through the overhead leaves and loved the warm sand under my tiny feet. This tiny forest was my first experience of what architecture might offer. Of course, I didn't know it at the time. The word architecture would sort of, uh-uh. It may be at the root of my love of indirect and overhead filtered lighting in my built works. At six, 
I was taken by my father to Newgrange, the 5,000-year-old tumulus and passage grave, whose design allowed the morning rays at the solstice to strike deep into its heart. It's rather like a giant kingfisher's nest. We had to borrow the key and the candle from a nearby farmer who told straight... Oops, sorry, wrong one. Oh, it, how do I go backwards on this? Sorry. The, there is backwards. We had to borrow a key and a candle from a nearby farmer who told strange stories of hauntings that made me feel a little nervous. I thought of ghosts. And we trudged through the thick, wet, high grass towards the locked metal gate. Deep inside, we reached the burial chamber. I thought I saw some small skeletal bones, possibly the, those of some dead little wild animal who had wandered in there, which frightened me. I ran back out of the passage and sat on the great stone, tracing the spiral carvings with my fingers. <clears throat> Last month, I watched a video of the German artist Joseph Beuys showing how to draw the three-lobed Triskel in one line. the fiscal that I had seen over 80 years ago. It gave me a new look at something that had scared me in my childhood and led to a question that I will raise at the end of this talk. <coughs> that same year, I went by bus with some other boys to Weir Square School in the Dublin City area known as the Liberties. Oops, sorry, not there yet. Excuse me. I thought I was good at this sort of thing. <coughs> One day I got off the bus, announced that I was too tired to go to school. And the other boys just went on to school and said, OK. And I began the long walk home through the city streets at six years of age. I watched the lock keeper manage the great lock gates of the Grand Canal as a barge was rocked by the sheer power of released waters. At the brickworks gate, I watched a small steam engine pull a chain of metal bogies filled with hot bricks through a long water trough and produce, as they cooled, a roaring cloud of steam storing, soaring skyward. This was better than all the school classes in the world. I fell in love with bricks and masonry and water. However, I still have an unanswered, unanswered question about a brick, which I will tell you at the end. That same year, I spent six months in bed as a recommended and prescribed cure for a disease called St. Vitus's Dance. So here I was, as a six-year-old dying to run around, in bed for six months, upstairs. No move out of the room. My father taught me to read in one night, and looking out the window, fortunately, at trees and meadows and birds and all sorts of creatures and planes going over, I learned a lot, and I learned, I read a lot of books about pirates and desert islands and all sorts of thrilling stuff. From age seven through to my early college years, I lived in a house on the banks of the River Dollar, just downstream from a small house on the waterfall. So that was my first house on the waterfall. Today was my second. That river and its environment shaped my career in more ways than I can count. We had all sorts of adventures and inventions and fishing and creation in Dr. Lombard's vast acreage across the river. Trees, streams, woodlands. My fear of tunnels and caves, stemming from my first visit to Newgrange, was allayed when I was 15 years old. Some boys showed me their secret pirate's cave, reached by a long sloping drainage pipe next to our football field. We sat in the huge vaulted chambers, lit by a few candles we had bought, telling pirate stories. As the novelty waned, I explored adjacent tunnels until 
even get, yes. Until my way was blocked by a masonry wall. Sensing something odd and placing my ear to the wall, I heard a roaring torrent on the other side. No one could explain the hidden torrent, so we all exited rather fast. We were fitted with collapse. The area is now covered by a housing development. Three years ago, I found the answer to what it was on an 1870 map of Dublin. The torrent was the River Poddle, one of Dublin's 26 underground rivers. The underground chambers were rem remnants of an ancient mill called the Rutland Mill, long since forgotten. To this day, my work reflects my fascination with caves and remote, quiet places. Those boys made it possible, years later, for me, under the guidance of the brilliant Professor Emmeline Richardson, to visit the 500 BC underground Etruscan caves in Tarquinia. The tomb of the hunter, which you see here, had a wall graphically transformed to be like the cheesecloth doors of his, of his original hunting tent. And through that graphic technique, outlines of animals beyond. Thus, he was escorted into the realms of happy hunting. Cheesecloth up on the left here, with animals running along the top, and buried through the cheesecloth. This, remember, is solid wall underground. But whoever the graphic artist was, 600 years ago or 800 years ago, transformed it into a transparent and translucent thing. I was equally thrilled by in Pestum, the tomb of the diver. It evoked memories of when I dived off the bridge of the daughter at Old Gardens. My college career is summed up in this view of my present studio. You see two elements. First year students were asked to draw and render in watercolor the incised Roman alphabet from Trajan's column. This limestone panel, that's not the drawing, etched by the great Joseph Katich, shows how that alphabet was made. My final thesis was an Olympic stadium, of which there's some drawings here, whose plan actually formed an omega shape, ending five years that began with alpha. Four years out of UCD's School of Architecture, I won a national competition for the design of an oratory on Croke Patrick, a barren mountain peak in the west of Ireland, where St. Patrick is said to have sought isolation and to have fasted for many days and many nights. I designed the place to shelter pilgrims from the fierce Atlantic winds. Little did I realize that a century after Patrick, the sixth century Coptic monks had faced similar environmental issues on the Skelligs, a mere 120 miles to the south. I showed them earlier. One day, in our Philadelphia apartment, Lou Kahn was bottle-feeding bottle feeding our son, Kieran, whom he cradled, our two-month-old son, while I fed his brother, Paul. Lou was like that. He'd feed a baby, if you ask. Well, what happened really was, Maureen said, Lou, make yourself useful. I've got to make the dinner, so feed Kieran. So he, she handed the bottle, and Lou went, feed the baby. Lou said to me, have you ever read a book called Architecture of Truth? He asked. I said, you mean this? And I pulled the book up from behind the couch. The book by Francois Cali, with a foreword by Le Corbusier. I think Rainer Heppelstone was the, the, the text, the introduction writer. It was a series of brilliant photographs of the medieval abbey of La Torne, accompanied by appropriate quotes from scripture, from sacred scripture. Lou suggested that I go there. I had to wait some years before a Rome prize enabled me to do so. Lou also suggested that I should visit the temple of Poseidon, or Hera too, in Pestum, which again the Rome prize enabled me to do. In 1962, 
I received a real lesson on the importance of the pragmatic in architecture. I was commissioned to do a small hotel on the side of Monte Argentario in Italy, north, about 90 kilometers north of Rome. Before I began, oh, well, I should show you the design, small hotel, cliff face here. Before I began construction drawings, the client invited me to visit the site, which was 8,000 miles from my small studio. I had to fly from San Francisco to Italy. After about half an hour on the cliff's edge site, I startled the client by saying, Michael, I'm afraid you have three bedrooms in the sea. Sure enough, we found that the site map he used was issued by the Commissione delle Belle Arte, was 300 years old, and that the cliff, the cliff had eroded just about an inch a year. Quite like, I redesigned the whole thing in three days. Peter Eisenman and some villains too, I just read, but quite like, I resigned, redesigned it. And Peter Eisenman told me a few years ago, 50 years after I had designed it, that Il Pelicano is his favorite hotel in the whole world. Coming from Peter, I think he must have been half drunk, but that's another story. <laughs> a little later, four of us in Berkeley at the University of California were urged by J.B. Jackson, editor of Landscape, to write a manifesto about our ideas. Toward making places received a lukewarm reception. But 10 years later, most schools were talking about architecture as making places. My first attempt at putting our thoughts into action was a commission to design a center for a small parish in Marina, California. Here was my chance, my chance to use natural light as a real determinant of form and space, but also to test my idea of degrees of inwardness so it could be built in four stages. The chapel itself with a series of degrees of inwardness a hall at extending the use of the chapel, a school extending that, and finally a residence. So it makes a place which has a series of degrees of forgetting the world and coming closer to spiritual reality. Oh, I should say about that church that uh, when it was still on the drawing board, a Belgian monk, Frederick de Wies, visiting our tiny San Francisco office, asked, may I publish it? It hasn't even been built yet, I said. He did publish it anyway, and later published the completed building in his journal. Oops, that's the wrong slide. Where are we going? Wrong way. Excuse me. Later published the completed building in his journal, Art Degrees, an issue in which also appeared Lucan's design for a Benedictine monastery at Valermo. The beast, the beast, reviewing both, wrote, henceforth a new impulse is at work, and described my small building as California's first truly modern church. Three experiences had, exper had inspired the design of the Marina Center. The rural barns of California. The book, Wooden Synagogues, by M. J. P. Kochka, which I hope some of you have read. And the little chapel at Fort Ross, California. I once drove Aldo Van Eyck and Denise Scott Brown to see the latter, which had been built by the Russians in 1828 and gave rise to the government's decision to promote the Monroe Doctrine about foreign occupation of places in America. <coughs> Alva was intrigued when I pointed out that the multi-curved dome, which brought light to the little chapel, had to be the work of a cooper, an unusual application of that difficult art. You see this reverse curved barrel, as it were. How did I know it might be designed by a cooper? Because my father, shown here as an apprentice, was a, became a master cooper in Guinnesses and hoped that I would do the same. The same year, 
Frederick de Bries persuaded some cloistered nuns to allow me to live briefly with them in their place near La Torone. They lent me a small hermitage, little oratory, designed, they said, by an African woman whose name they had forgotten. Thus, I spent three wonderful days exploring and drawing the abbey. In his, oh, its savage stones, as Fernand Puyon called them, became luminous at dawn and sunset. Long before and long after the few tourists came and went. But I found something else. The sound of the place is equally astounding. One can stand in a corner of the transept, just around the corner here, just in there, hidden away, and make a sound. Oh, and suddenly, suddenly you become a harmonious octet of beautiful voices as the space reverberates and amplifies your sound into something like a heavenly chorus. Amazing sound. Of course, you have to do it when there are no tourists there. In other words, they look for the choir. Ever afterwards, I tested the acoustics of my own built spaces by singing in them and by playing the space. I taught my students how to do this when we visited famous buildings. It's a technique that actors develop, good actors develop in their, their mature years, playing the space no matter what the space is. The American Academy in Rome finally allowed me to visit Pestum, as Lou Kahn had suggested. He had been there once with Vincent Scully. We missed, we missed a slide. Ah, yeah. He had been there once with Vincent Scully, who in his book, The Earth, the Temple and the Gods, had tried to describe their experience of looking from the Temple of Poseidon, the Temple of Hera too, really, to the distant Temple of Ceres. They found the space between the columns a very satisfying, aesthetically, and in other ways. It was there in 1980 that I learned that we draw in order to see, not the reverse. For I discovered something that neither Scully nor Khan had consciously observed, what I call the porches of Bestum. I could see why Lou would have loved this, this muscular temple and why he conceived there his dictum, consider the moment when the walls parted and the column became. As I drew, I felt that the lower third of the column's volume seemed to equal the volume of the space between them giving the space a feeling, of a feeling of implied yet secure enclosure, like a porch. Then I noticed the raised plates. Squares of travertine raised about the thickness of a pen, less than half an inch. Between each pair of columns was a very slightly raised place of travertine, in all my studies of classical architecture, I had never come across anything like the implication of space that this mere detail produced. Later, I reported my discovery in a talk at the American Academy. Other architects, including Stanley Tigerman, were both amused and intrigued. But one historian, little pompous, asked, why aren't they in the cello? I don't know, said I. He went on to say I could find similar details at Aegina, Ramnus, and other classical sites. So off I went to Aegina, Athens, Agrigento, Delphi, Basse, and many other sites. To no avail. Nowhere else could I find such a detail. Nowhere. Aegis, Sicilia, the Parthenon. Nowhere was such a detail. I concluded that few noticed them. Because many people seem to look up at temples and seldom do they spend time 
looking at the base, at the floor. This from an 18th century Dublin building. Monkeys playing snooker or billiards at the bottom of the column. Very clever 18th century detail. That time when I was in bed for six months, avidly reading about places of enchantment like pirate caves and magic castles, I came across an image of the perfect castle in one of my father's reference books. I'd never seen anything like this. I was six and a half years old. I felt that one day I would go there, not knowing where it was. When Joe Connors, the Baroque historian, at the American Academy said, you must go to Mount Athos. I finally realized that dream. As I rounded a bend in the trail after a long and arduous journey, I was struck silent by its magnificence. I had realized my childhood dream, even if the monks allowed me to stay for only one night. I vowed to come back, and a year later, the Greek and Athenite authorities permitted me to spend a month on the holy mountain. The monastery is Simono Petra, reached by a trail ascending from the sea and by a winding trail across the mountain and towering on a f five or seven hundred feet above the sea. Of course, I went drawing on other parts of the mountain. I had a month. I visited about 15 monasteries. But I found the way, and I was trying to find out what basic plan allowed such a variety of outcomings in this rugged mountain. For instance, Simono Petra on the left is at the peak of this 700-foot height. Hilandari, on the other hand, is in a quiet valley and spreads out but still contains itself with a fortified wall on the outside. Unfortunately, Hillandari, which I drew here on the left, was burned down a few years ago and will never, is being replaced, but will never have the same delightful, detailed intimacy. The passage on the right is in Simona Petra. One of the great things about it is the complexity of its innards, which have you wondering and wondering at the same time. There is a great peace along these, the narrow and oh, <laughs> another monastery very enclosed, Dociario, where one is totally inwards and there's no possibility of uh, being outward looking. So the range of approach to solitude is tremendous. A view of the, mon of the mountain itself, it's 2,000 meters, 6,000 feet high. There was peace there and rich silence and gentle spaces. It was the antithesis on the mountain trails of the monasteries themselves. I came close to panic when once I was lost on the high ridge of the mountain, over this ridge here, between the peak, between the peak and about 20 miles north here, there's a ridge running along the spine of the peninsula. I came close to panic when I was lost on the high ridge of the mountain. And it is a pretty strange thing when you realize you're about to panic, so you stop. Fortunately, and you turn back somehow through the woods. Fortunately, it had rained the previous night, and I found one of my footprints in the mud, indicating whence I had come. I can understand why monks sought out this gentle isolation as an escape from the crowded deserts of Egypt, and even today, from the crowded deserts of an increasingly digital world. It is odd despite the fact that Christians and Jains alike in their early days claim that we have no temples, we have no altars, 
I'm quoting Minucius Felix there, yet each proceeded to build larger and greater and richer edifices than their predecessors. In 1959, 500 architects, including Peter Eisenman and yours truly, submitted designs for an international competition for Liverpool Cathedral. This is a, a printing block of one of mine, based on a concept that I had developed in Lou Kahn's graduate studio. A couple of years later, Lou Kahn was being considered for the design of the new San Francisco Cathedral. When the Archbishop of San Francisco turned him down as a possible architect for his new cathedral, Lou wrote to me, I'm quoting, a cathedral should be the last thing a man does before he closes his book. <laughs> when I made some sketches from memory after returning from a visit to Dhaka, I wrote that the Dhaka Mosque had to be Lou's cathedral. He died on the way home from his last visit there. When I spent a week visiting Gary's uh, Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, I was not allowed to photograph interiors, and so I drew, naturally. In doing so, I saw that this was his cathedral. And Sahak Hadid's cathedral was surely her Glasgow Museum of Transportation. Calatrava's new subway in New York is surely his. Why this urge to build mountainous works? Some spiritual urge to push beyond the possible? Is it one way of looking at Lou's notion to reach the immeasurable one first must go through the measurable? When I first saw the towers of San Gimignano, I thought of the young woman, young woman Freya Stark, who in the 1930s traveled with two female companions through the desert of the Hadramuth and photographed the stunning mud skyscrapers that, treated, that created cooling shade and moving air between their narrow streets. I thought, too, of how the Hittites built six or seven-story underground cities carved out of the soft tufa of Cappadocia. Maureen and I once had tea there, about three stories down one afternoon, and it was quite comfortable, beautiful air, fresh water from the well beneath the ventilation shaft. I thought, too, of the underground communities in South Tunisia, structures that were equally climate-oriented, as described by Hermann Hahn. These were pushing primitive technology to the limits in a search for what? Perhaps the quiet majesty of forests, great mountains, great deserts inspired them, or perhaps simply pragmatic sense. I find contrast, too, in how we have used natural light to evoke the unmeasurable. In a Roman, in a Roman Baroque church in Trastevere, a tiny church which is nameless, uh, the sun's rays are caught, sun rays are caught in these upper windows and touch tiny excrescences in the gilded surfaces, turning it into a magic place in the evening. In Le Corbusier's La Tourette, I found out why he did not have anybody sand off the drippings of concrete, wet concrete, that came through the formwork on the, on the roof, underneath the roof. Because at sunset, the rays touched those little dull gray concrete excrescences and created a ceiling of gold. In Trastevere, there is a tiny church, hardly discoverable entrance here, uh, beside a cafe and back blocked by hundreds of cars, as usual in Trastevere. The obscure entrance to San Bernadetto in Piscinula. Off the modest narthex is a tiny cave-like space where Benedict is reputed to have slept during his visits. Then when one enters the small chapel, the space seems suddenly to expand in a transcendental natural illumination. It's the contrast 
between the closure of the cave and the opening up to the sky. Kite-like, its builders used fragments from Monte Tostasio for the columns. Note how odd each of these columns is. They were collected from the Roman city dump to build the church. And here I am, drawing smaller and smaller spaces. My cave-like apse, where Jewish community gathers, a room where the Protestant community gathers, and the whole thing where the Catholic community gathers on Sunday. It's a little chapel attached to a retirement home, where all sorts of people from the aged to those with dementia live. A tiny addition to our own campus, Coach Chapel and Cultural Center. And one day soon, I had a call yesterday afternoon from a priest who is developing, and for which I did a master plan two years ago, a chapel attached to a little retreat he's calling Fire Mountain in Massachusetts, near Jacob's Pillow. It's a retreat for urban missionaries whose responsibility is not to proselytize or evangelize, but simply to listen, to listen and listen further to what the homeless and abandoned have to say and have to ask. I had a call, an email from him today, yesterday, to say that Yes, it may start, they may start the fundraising again this fall. The pandemic, of course, uh, delayed it all. Remoteness is so often sought as a counter to the mundane. Yet in the mundane can be found poetic and spiritual inspiration. Annie Dillard, whom I met one day in Rome, whose book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, won a Pulitzer Prize, described her year in isolation. You can heave your spirit into a mountain, and the mountain will keep it, fold it, and not throw it back, as some creeks will. The creeks are the world with all its stimulus and beauty. I live there, but the mountains are my home. I asked some nuns in Schenectady, New York, why they, why they had a hut at the end of their garden. These were enclosed nuns, Carmelites. That is the desert, they said. You can go to the desert there. One of my students, my Berkeley student, Sade Hayashida, wrote in a small publication that my class produced for an international conference in San Francisco in 1966. Sade wrote this. Medit and he was a Buddhist. Oh, I think he was, no, he, yeah, Zen Buddhist. Meditation or contemplation suggests quietness, serenity, calm, or placidness. In Buddhism, such activity requires a place of timeless quality, a dribble of water, a burning candle, drops of rain, a grain of sand. This place can have limited boundaries, either inside or out, and provision for a few people or only one. The vagueness the vagueness of the definition of this place is due to the nature of the act of meditation, for the individual in this place can transcend its finite boundaries. Whether it be the act of learning or meditation or of experience, if there is to be a place, the place must have flexibility and the capacity for change. I think he was 19 when he wrote this. I don't know where he is today. This is a view of the little part of the chapel which can be... Uh, closed off from a hollow column for the Jewish group at the Eddy Chapel. My contribution to kite-like adaptability came in remodeling the sanctuary of a shik the sanctuary of a Chicago church for an African-American, uh, an impoverished African-American community. I, I, I used a jet restrainer parachute used, which we bought in an army supply store, which served as a baldacchino 
which Tom Brown and I strung up on the column capitals. Now that was truly minimal design. I will end with two questions and a final quote. The tiny shamrock which the world associates with St. Patrick was surely too small for St. Patrick to explain the nature of the Divine Trinity when he spoke to the High King Cormac MacArt and the Royal Court at Tara, near Newgrange. My father always claimed that Patrick must have used the larger trefoil known as wood sorrel. I wonder, did Patrick know of the, of the beautiful Tiscala, which could still be seen in many Boyne Valley carvings? The Tiscala is a perfect example of how three elements can be one and can be even drawn with a single unbroken line, a line which possibly illustrates three phases of human life. I was going to draw it on this pad, but I can show you how it's drawn here. It starts as a line, perhaps birth, growing, outside of the family, into life, experiences, explosions of ideas, and discovering that maybe there was some good in what we once had. <laughs> and the third phase of life, where one becomes a little more contained, shall we say, and less worried about riches and expansion, and comes to the end. But it could be an explanation of the Trinity, it could be an explanation of three phases of life. I don't know. But Patrick could have used it. My second question is a nagging question that no one in the world seems to be able to answer, and it's a pragmatic question. Nothing to do with spirituality. Why is a hollow in the surface of a brick called a frog? F-R-O-G. This is a brick from the brickworks, no longer there, that I visited when I was a little boy. I close with Eunice D'Souza's little poem. It's time to find a place to be silent with each other. I've prattled endlessly in staff rooms, corridors, restaurants. When you're not around, I carry on conversations in my head. Even this poem has 48 words too many, as I have. Thank you. <laughs>